Good morning, Northgate. Good morning. good morning. It is so good to see you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Well, it is so good to see everybody this morning on a cool Sunday morning. We have been through all four seasons in one weekend, but at least it's not snowing this morning, you know, so it was easier to get to worship. So I'm glad that you all made it. I'm glad that the weather worked out and that we're all here together in community because I love being here in worship with you. I do have some announcements to make this morning, as always, so that we all know what's happening in the life of our church because I really want all of us to be as involved as we can be. And the easiest way to do that is when we all know what's going on. So yesterday, my first announcement is that we had our annual retreat and it was wonderful. We were joined, and amen to that, it was so great. We had a great turnout. We were joined by Reverend Owen Ross, who led us in several workshops, and he really enabled us to envision the types of ministry that we seek to embody in 2022. It was just a great turnout. There was a lot of energy, and I've been talking to people who went and have just gotten such wonderful feedback. Thank you to Charlie and to the Long Range Planning Team for planning the retreat, and thank you so much to all of you who attended. It was great to be with you. Our next Food Pantry and Clothes Closet Distribution Day is going to be held on Saturday, February the 19th, from 8.30 until 10.30 a.m. If you would like to volunteer in our food pantry or in our clothes closet, or if you would just like to contribute to those ministries, maybe you're not really ready to be there to give out food, but you would like to contribute in some way, that's perfectly fine. We can use you. Please let Maxine or Ruth know, and they will be more than happy to help you get more involved. Last Thursday was our quarterly meal for many helping hands. We had several volunteers who served a meal to people who were experiencing homelessness. Northgate's participation in this effort was headed up by Janan, who does a wonderful job of spearheading this important yeah. outreach ministry. Thank you, Janan. You did a great job as always, and we appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who continues to faithfully participate in this ministry every quarter. Charlie is still leading his study on 1st Maccabees, and the information for the study is available on the Northgate website. The study involves Zoom discussions every week, and the next discussion session will be held today at 4.30 p.m. Is that correct? 4.30? Okay. The time changed from last week, so I wanted to make sure that I got the time right. If you would like to participate in that ongoing study, if you haven't yet, it's not too late. I think Charlie would be happy to have you. He's here this morning, so all you have to do is just go let him know, and he will be happy to get the information that you need so that you can get connected. Also, the first Maccabee study, it's great, but it's not going to go on forever, y'all. At some point, Charlie needs a break, and it is going to end, and so when that happens, after that study's over, I am planning to lead a study that is going to take place during Lent. I'm going to be leading a study that was written by Adam Hamilton, and it's called The Lord's Prayer, The Meaning and Power of the Prayer Jesus Taught. This is going to be a six-week study, and we are going to be hosting that on Zoom, just like we did with our Advent study. I thought that that was really good. It worked well for people so that people don't have to drive at night, and it worked well for anybody who's concerned about covid and things like that, then they can just stay home in their own living room with your pets, you know, with your snacks. Do what you need to do. It's fine. The format is also going to be similar to our Advent study. And there's a book that you can read that I actually brought with me. Hold on. Here we go. Um, this is Worship in Action, y'all. I forgot to bring it up here. So this is the book. It's the Lord's Prayer. And there will also be videos that I will share on Zoom that are 10 to 15 minute videos that Adam had produced. There's going to be a little prayer time and there's also going to be some discussions. So that study is going to begin on Sunday, March the 6th. And it will be held from 6 o'clock until 7 o'clock p.m. on Sunday evenings. 
This book is available on Amazon. So feel free to go to Amazon. And don't forget, if you use the Amazon Smile program, you can designate Northgate as a recipient and we will get a small percentage. And trust me, y'all, it is small. Um, but we'll take whatever we can get. But we will get a small percentage of the price that you spend on the book. It does not increase the price of the book, but it does help out Northgate. So, if you would like to do that, you can order this on Amazon or at any other place that it's sold. And if you want to participate in this study, go ahead and send me an email. My email address is pastor.jennifer at northgateumc.org. I am really looking forward to doing this study together, and I'm looking forward to Lent. And with that, that's all the announcements that I have this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our liturgist, Gail, and she's going to lead us this morning in our call to worship. Please stand as able and join me in the call to worship. Poor or despairing, come to be blessed. Sorrowing or sighing, come to discover joy. Share your hopes, your dreams. Come as you are. All are welcome here. Let us pray. God of blessings and woes, bless us with your presence this day. Reveal your way forward and guide us in pathways of hope and grace. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as David comes to lead us in our opening hymn. Our opening hymn is I'm Gonna Sing When the Spirit Says Sing, number 333. <laughs> joy, and that is the retreat that we had yesterday. It was such a joy to be with everyone who came out and who attended, and it was a joy for me to be able to envision what the future holds for this amazing church. I am so grateful to be in ministry with you, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the ways that God will continue to work in and through our church. And I'm also grateful to you for your continued financial support. If you would like to give of your tithes and offerings, you can do so in many different ways. 
If you're worshiping with us in person this morning, you can give of your tithes and offerings by leaving them in the, in the donation box in the back of the Worship Activity Center. If you're worshiping with us online this morning or anytime, you're invited to go to the church website and to scroll down and click the donate button. Or you can always mail a check to the church. Thank you for your continued generosity. As I lift up each additional joy and concern, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond, Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who are lonely and feel isolated, may God be with them and show them God's love and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. For all teachers who are struggling right now with the ongoing shortage of other teachers, may God be with them and provide them with the help and the resources they need. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, For those who are sick, especially those who are in the hospital for any reason, may God be with them and with their health care providers and bring them comfort and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For Northgate, may God continue to open up new potentialities for us to grow and thrive in this season. And may God lead us to do God's will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Rick, I, you have I, I don't have a pneumonia in my body. Yay. Wonderful. Rick just said that he does not have pneumonia. Can we get, can we get an amen for that? Thank you for sharing. That is, an answer. that is an answer to a lot of prayers. Thank you for sharing. We have our prayer list, which is in the bulletins that you have. You are invited, as always, to take your bulletin home with you. And as you pray every day, I would encourage you to lift up everyone who is on our prayer list and to keep them in mind when you pray. If you would like to be added to our prayer list, that is easy to do. All you have to do is go to the church website and you can click on the button and submit a prayer request. And you can ask to be added to our prayer list and we'll be happy to add you. Or you can email me directly at pastor.jennifer at northgateumc.org and we're happy to add you. If you would like or if you need personal prayers, but you don't necessarily want to be added to our prayer list for everyone to see, that's perfectly fine. Sometimes people have private prayers and that's fine too. I would be honored to pray with you. If you want to call me or send me an email, I can pray with you at any time. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Unto you, Lord, we bring our praise and our thanksgiving this day. We are a sinful people, Lord, and yet you have loved us. We are a rebellious people, and yet you have forgiven us. And though our words and actions distanced us from your holy presence, yet in Christ you have healed the breach and brought us close to you once more. Though we are worthy of death, yet in Christ you offer us life everlasting. His resurrection assures us of our own hope for the future. No longer does death oppress your love has overcome death and gives us hope. Help us to be faithful to that divine hope as we pray in the name of the one whose resurrection is our hope. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's all stand as we're able and join in the singing. Go tell it on the mountain, number 251. Scripture kind of takes us away from the, the story that I had. You know, remember uh, Paul the Baptist and his great, 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 probably a few more greats, grandson, John the Baptist. You know, Paul the Baptist, the one that rode through New England going, Jesus is risen, Jesus, and you don't remember that guy. So uh, this story kind of starts making us 
question some things. Uh, how many of you think liquid is wet? Anybody in here think liquid is wet? Yeah. Somebody throws some water in your face, what happens? You get wet. Well, what happened if you watch the guy walk into a pool on one side and walk out of the other and his clothes were completely dry? What would you think? First thing I think is dry cleaning fluid. <laughs> but so what, what happens when what you think is real might not be? And that's kind of what this story is. The, the people in the scripture are questioning whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead, whether anybody could be raised, whether God had the power. That didn't really happen. And Paul was basically going, well, if that doesn't happen, why, what have we been doing all this time today? Because if we don't believe Christ is raised from the dead, why are we even here? Why are we doing this? That's the fundamental part of the faith. And so y'all need to keep in mind that just because somebody questions whether water is wet because they saw a guy walk in one side of the pool and walk out the other and it's dry, doesn't mean water isn't wet anymore. If somebody's questioning whether Christ was raised from the dead, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It happened. God gave his only son, and that was a big deal. His only son. So, uh, with that, let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your son, for raising him up and sacrificing for our sins. Be with us this week and bring us back again joyfully next week.
Every year in February, the United States honors the contributions and the sacrifices of African Americans who have helped shape our nation. Black History Month celebrates the rich cultural heritage, the triumphs, and the adversities that are an indelible part of our country's history. For today's Black History Month presentation, I would like to invite Theodore to the pulpit to give a presentation on August Wilson. Do you ever wonder what it takes to get your picture on a postage stamp? Well, in the case of the 2021 Black History Stamp Honoree, August Wilson, he became a foremost playwright winning Pulitzer and Tony Awards. August was born Frederick August Kito, whose mother was African American and his father a German immigrant. Growing up in Pittsburgh, August encountered relentless bigotry as a biracial child. At the age of 15, he dropped out of traditional school and received an independent education at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. August seemed destined to write for the theater, deciding to pay homage to his mother by taking her last name as part of his stage name. In 1968, he and a friend co-founded the Black Horizon Theater in New York. And now today there is a theater on Broadway named after August Wilson. He is best known for a series of 10 plays collectively called The Pittsburgh Cycle, which chronicle the experiences and heritage of the African-American community in the 20th century. Best known of these are Fences and the Piano Lesson. Several of his plays have been made into movies as well. August noted, I think my plays offer white Americans a different way to look at black Americans. He told the Paris Review. For instance, in Francis, they see a garbage man, a person they really don't look at, although they see a garbage man every day. By looking at Troy's life, white people find out that the content of, his black, of this black garbage man's life is affected by the same things, love, honor, beauty, betrayal, duty. Recognizing that these things are as much part of his life as theirs can affect how they think about and deal with black people in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Please stand as able for the reading from God's holy word. And let us hear the word of God from the 15th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits 
of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Friends, would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you so much for another joyful, beautiful Sunday. Thank you for bringing us together again and giving us this opportunity to worship you, to adore you, and to glorify you. Lord, may your words be on my lips. Open our ears to hear you and our hearts to understand you more. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to worship and welcome back to week six of our sermon series, Love Never Ends, Being the Body of Christ. This winter in this sermon series, we're taking a look at the body of Christ and we are looking at it through the lens of love. We started our sermon series on Epiphany and we took a look at the baptism of Jesus by John in the River Jordan as recounted in Luke's Gospel. We then moved on to 1 Corinthians, which is where we're gonna spend most of our time during this sermon series. And we talked about 1 Corinthians 12 and about our spiritual gifts. We looked at how each of us have spiritual gifts and how we are called to use our spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ and to love one another well. We then read the rest of chapter 12 and we talked about how we, the church, are the body of Christ. We then got to chapter 13, which is the famous love chapter, and we talked about becoming love in a difficult and complicated world. And last week we moved to the beginning of chapter 15. We talked about holding firm in the basics of our Christian faith. So this morning we're gonna continue to look more deeply at chapter 15 because there's really a lot to unpack here. Now, if you'll remember last week when we started talking about chapter 15, we were reminded that Paul was talking to the Corinthian church about the basics of their faith. He knows that they know the basics of their faith because he's the one who told it to them in the first place. And that was the story he had received. And he passed it on to them and proclaimed it to them. He was concerned about reports he was receiving from different sources, not just about divisions in the church and their problems, and goodness knows they had a lot of those. The Corinthian church had significant problems, and we talked about them over the past several weeks. They had problems with members who were disagreeing with each other. They were disagreeing to the point where they were actually suing each other, which is not great. I mean, there were all kinds of problems going on. But he's also concerned about reports he's received about some people not believing in the resurrection of the body. And so last week, at the beginning of chapter 15, we talked about how he reminded the Corinthian church about he told them what he had received, how Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that Jesus was buried, and raised on the third day, also in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to a bunch of different people. Paul's reminding them that it's not just him and his account that they need to rely on to be able to believe in the story, because there's lots of people Jesus appeared to. And so that's really the basis and the background for where we're going this morning. Today's passage is a response to the debate that comes up in the church in Corinth about the resurrection of the dead. 
And scholars have said that people in Corinth generally agree that they, most of them thought that Jesus was raised from the dead. They probably believe that because of the passage we read last week. That Paul gave all these eyewitness accounts and pointed them towards this whole litany and this list of people to whom the resurrected Christ appeared. So I'm not so sure that it was a huge debate about whether Christ was resurrected. For some people it might have been. But there was definitely a debate about whether there's a resurrection of the dead beyond that. And that's where Paul's coming from in today's passage. And it's interesting because today's passage seems both really repetitive, and in my opinion at least, it's kind of confusing, um, which is weird because it continues to repeat itself, so you would think that would clarify things, not always so much. So part of that, I think, part of the confusion, I think, is the repetition, and part of it is just the way that he lays out his argument. But basically, going through the text today, Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the dead generally, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our proclamation has been in vain, and our faith has been in vain. He's relying on their belief that Christ was raised from the dead. So basically, he's saying, you already think that's true. We already covered this. And if that's not true for Christ, it's not going to be true for any of us. And if it's not true for any of us, then what are we doing? Then everything we've been proclaiming and believing in has been in vain. Because we would have been found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified of God, we said God raised Christ. So it says, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And what I think is so interesting about this text is that he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. One of the questions of this text is, well, what's the upshot of that? What's the point? Why does it matter? whether or not Christ was actually raised from the dead. Why does the resurrection matter so much to him? And what does it mean if it's not true? And for Paul, his argument in this particular section is not one that a lot of people would normally expect him to make if they had never read this text before. Because he does not say, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then you stay forever, dead forever when you die, and you won't be raised from the dead. That's not what it says. That's what I would expect him to say if I hadn't read this before. But that's not what it says. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. That's a different take than saying, when you die, you stay dead forever which is how people often think of death, right? I mean, death is usually pretty permanent. That's what we tend to think. But it's an important distinction because it shows how Paul ties resurrection to a really important concept, forgiveness. In Christ, our sins are forgiven. It is a crucial concept for us as Christians and as United Methodists. We name that specifically in our communion liturgy. When I stand at the communion table once a month and preside over the sacrament and I say, hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then later in our communion liturgy, it says, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Resurrection and forgiveness are inextricably linked. And we're unquestionably called to forgive. We see that in the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. When Peter asked Jesus how often he should forgive if a member of the church sins against him. He suggests seven times. This is a reasonable option. You know, I mean, that seven sounds like a good number. But Jesus says not seven times, but 77 times. 
With the emphasis we see on forgiveness today, how do we really live into that? Because after living my whole life as a Christian, I think I understand the importance of forgiveness. So why is it so hard for me to do it? And it's not like I don't have any good examples of forgiveness, because I actually do. When I was growing up, and I was going to Catholic church, and I was in a Catholic school, I vividly remember hearing about the assassination attempt against Pope John Paul II. Does anybody else remember this? Y'all remember this happening? In May of 1981, Pope John Paul II was entering St. Peter's Square in Vatican City when he was shot twice by a man who had threatened to kill him and was trying to make good on that threat. The assailant shot and critically wounded the Pope and then fled the scene. Fortunately, he was apprehended pretty quickly by the Vatican security chief, apparently, as legend has it, by several spectators and a nun. I have to say, y'all just interrupting here for a moment, that the nun jumping in to help might be one of my favorite parts of this story, but you know, that's neither here nor there. But the most remarkable thing about it is that the assassin was sentenced to life imprisonment for that assassination attempt. And he was later paroled in 2000 at the Pope's request. The Pope not only forgave him from his hospital bed, I mean, he had forgiven him a long time before that, he forgave him for literally attempting to murder him. They became friends. And the Pope kept in touch with the guy's family over the years. I mean, it was really to the point where in 2005, when the Pope got really sick right before he died, the guy wrote him a letter and wished him well. Their relationship was healed. How do we do that? How do we live into the forgiveness that we have received and that we're supposed to offer? And especially, how do we do that in the face of something that happens to us that seems so unforgivable? Something that really strikes at the core of who we are. How do we forgive evil? I don't claim to be an expert on this topic. Honestly, it's something I continue to struggle with. We are surrounded by sin, and there are lots of things that happen all the time that make it hard for me to just jump up and want to forgive. But I agree with Nadia Bowles Weber on this one. She says, our human culture would say that evil is fought through justice and might. It would tell us that the way we combat evil is by making sure that people get what they have coming to them. An eye for an eye. You attack me, and I'll attack you. Fair is fair. And there are times in my own life when I've been hurt, and I'm sure that retaliation would make me feel better. But then, when I can't harm the person who harmed me, I just end up harming the people who love me. So maybe retaliation or holding on to anger about the harm that's been done to us, or maybe living in fear of it happening again, doesn't actually combat evil. It feeds it. In the end, we can actually absorb the worst of our enemy, and on some level, even become endangered of becoming them. Because it would seem that when we are sinned against, when someone else harms us, we're in some way linked to that sin. We're connected to that mistreatment like a chain through which we absorb it. And we know that our anger and our fear and our resentment, it doesn't free us at all. It keeps us chained. And evil persists. Sin abounds. Brokenness prevails, or so it would seem. But Richard Rohr reminds us that we can tell a lot by what a person does with their suffering. 
Do they transmit it or do they transform it? So while it's true that God might not prevent evil, and we may never fully understand why, God does have a way of combating evil. It's not punishment or retaliation or fear or anger. It's forgiveness. When someone does something to us, we need to forgive. And we are filled with righteous anger and resentment. It slowly eats away at us. There's nothing liberating about that. There's no healing in that. All it does is keep us bound to the person who hurt us as we continue to relive and rehash all those old hurts and wounds. It reinflicts those old injuries on us, and then it compounds them with new ones, as if we weren't already hurt enough. As the old saying goes, harboring resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It just feels so good to keep going back to that anger. It makes us feel right. It makes us feel justified in our resentment. And all it does is take the pain that the other person inflicted on us and it extends it even more. As it turns out, when we refuse to forgive people who hurt us, when we sit and stew in our anger and our resentment because we want to hurt them, we are hurting someone. We're hurting ourselves. I've been thinking a lot about the link between forgiveness and resurrection. And it reminds me of Brene Brown. She is a research professor at the University of Houston who has researched and written extensively about courage vulnerability, shame, and empathy. She's written several books, one of which is called Rising Strong. And the front cover of the book says, if we are brave enough, often enough, we will fall. This is a book about getting back up. She talks about a lot of things in that book, but one of the topics is forgiveness. And she shares a story from a talk she heard about forgiveness that was given at her church by their pastor, Joe. She says, several years ago, I was at church listening to Joe talk about forgiveness. He was sharing his experience of counseling a couple who were on the brink of divorce after the woman discovered that her husband was having an affair. They were both devastated by the potential end of their marriage, but she couldn't forgive him for betraying her and he couldn't seem to forgive himself either. Joe looked up and said, in order for forgiveness to happen, something has to die. If you make a choice to forgive, you have to face into the pain. You simply have to hurt. It made sense to Brene because she said, forgiveness is so difficult because it involves death and grief. The death or ending that forgiveness necessitates comes in many shapes and forms. We might need to bury our expectations or our dreams. We might need to relinquish the power that comes with being right or put to rest the idea that we can do what's in our hearts and still retain the support and the approval of others. Joe explained, whatever it is, it all has to go. It isn't good enough to just box it up and set it aside. It has to die. It has to be grieved. And that's a high price. Sometimes it's just too much. What Brene ultimately concluded, though, what she saw both in her research and in her own life, is that those deaths of what has to die are scary and painful, but they're also beautiful because those make room for new relationships. And those new relationships are authentic and honest. And sometimes they're even new relationships with the very same people. They're just founded on emotional and physical safety in place of fear and pain. 
In the end, forgiveness often requires death. Death of our expectations, our assumptions, and sometimes our hopes. But it's a death that leads to new life. We can grieve the loss, but we grieve in hope while we wait for the resurrection. Forgiveness does not mean excusing or condoning what happened to us. It means we're finally breaking the chain that tied us to what that person did to us in the first place. It means we're so opposed to what they did that we refuse to be tied to it anymore. And by forgiving them, we set ourselves free. Friends, would you pray with me? Gracious, loving, sustaining, forgiving, and resurrecting God, thank you so much for everything that you give us. Thank you for this good news. Thank you for resurrection, which is a miracle every day. God, be with us as we go through everything that we go through. Help us to grieve our losses and help us to wait in hope for resurrection. In your name we pray, amen. Friends, it was wonderful to be with you this morning. If you have felt God calling you into a deeper relationship at any point in the service, I would love to hear from you. I would love to talk to you about that. If you want to pray together, if you want to talk about that, if you want to have coffee, if you're not sure what resurrection really means, we can talk about it. It's all on the table. You can contact me at any time. Now let's continue to worship. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is, There is a Balm in Gilead, number 375. Let's all stand now as we're able and join in singing.
Well, friends, it was wonderful to be in worship with you again this morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Please come back next week. We're going to be here again, as I always say, same bad time, same bad channel. We'll be here at 1045 next Sunday morning here in the WAC. It's going to be really great. So as you go forth today, please receive this benediction. May God be with us, may God sustain us, and may God prepare us for the resurrection anew. And may God go with us until we meet again.